I think Deborah, hopefully you can uh, hear me. I'm just going to let uh, leave it a minute or two to allow people to join. See, people are still trickling in. All right, people are still joining, but I'm going to get going anyway, because we've got a lot to get through. So um, my name is Matt Saker, President of the IFOA, and it's my pleasure to be chairing uh, this webinar today. Uh, so this is the fourth and final event in this year's presidential speaker series on alternate economic thinking, uh, which is focused on whether traditional economic models are still fit for purpose and able to tackle the many deep and difficult issues faced by societies all over the world, including climate change and, and things like rising inequality. Um, to ensure that our members and others uh, can understand the perspective of a number of different parties, this series has brought together experts from a range of economic disciplines, uh, as well as the IFOA's own thought leadership community, to discuss and debate whether alternate economic thinking is required to address the various challenges facing society. Uh, and of course, perhaps most importantly, we've sought to understand what these theories could mean for the actual profession and its work. Just to note, you'll be able to rewatch the full video recording of this session on demand via the IFOA's virtual learning environment and also on the YouTube channel. So today's session will focus on the power of purposeful business. Uh, purpose is the current corporate buzzword uh, with politicians, the public and even shareholders calling on businesses to serve wider society. Uh, but of course, purpose is also controversial uh, because companies have a responsibility to deliver returns to investors. So this talk will critically examine the case for purposeful business uh, using rigorous evidence and real life examples to show what works and importantly, what doesn't work. Uh, we'll discuss practical ways for businesses of all sizes to put purpose into practice to ensure it guides a company's day-to-day -day decisions. It's in embedded throughout the organisation and enhances rather than jeopardises long-term shareholder value. Uh, and to help us discuss this important topic, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, uh, Alex Edmonds. Um, so Alex is Professor of Finance at London Business School. Uh, he has a PhD from MIT uh, as a Fulbright Scholar and was previously a tenured professor at Wharton and investment banker at Morgan Stanley. Uh, Alex has spoken at the World Economic Forum in Davos, testified in the UK Parliament, and given a number of TED Talks uh, with a combined viewing of over two and a half million. Pretty impressive. Uh, he serves as non-executive director of the Investment Forum and on Royal London Asset Management's Responsible Investment Advisory Committee. Alex's book, uh, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, uh, was a Financial Times Book of the Year for 2020. Uh, and he's also co-author of Principles of Corporate Finance. Uh, he's won 24 teaching awards at Wharton and LBS and was named Professor of the Year by Poets and Quants in 2021. Uh, now, I believe Alex is going to talk for around 40 minutes, uh, following which we'll have around 20 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, you can add your questions into the Q&A box uh, on, on the Zoom. Uh, and to help me to call out things, I'd encourage you to start posting questions uh, as uh, early, early as, early as you can, uh, as you can, as soon as they occur to you, and I can start coordinating them. Uh, so, without further delay, it's my pleasure to hand over to Alex. Alex, over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you to the Institute for inviting me and thank you to all the audience for uh, giving up an hour to hear my thoughts on this topic. So, as Matt said, I'm going to speak about purposeful business, but with the idea of alternative economic thinking, I'm going to have purpose from a different angle to what you typically hear. So when people speak about purpose, it's often based on the moral and ethical case. And certainly morals and ethics are important. 
but also businesses need to be financially successful. And so one of the concerns about purpose, particularly in the US, is that is purpose a distraction from a business making long term profits? And even in the UK, I'm sure many people are familiar with Terry Smith, a leading long term oriented investor, arguing that Unilever was too busy trying to define the purpose of mayonnaise when it's in salads and sandwiches. That's its main goal. You don't need to come up with a higher purpose. But my role as a finance professor and as an ex-investment banker is to argue how purpose is something not just good for wider society, but also for the long-term sustainability and success of a business. Now, that seems quite too good to be true. So let me start with an example to show you what I have in mind. So I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey away from your offices or home offices to halfway around the world. So I'm going to take you to the Great Rift Valley. Now, this stretches across two continents and 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon in Asia to Mozambique in Africa. And it has some of the world's highest mountains like this one, but also some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is in the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. Now, fewer than a thousand people call this lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes a living selling and herding goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be that cash was king. When he sold a goat, he'd receive some cash, but he'd then have to check that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and worry about it being stolen. And then to bank that cash, it wasn't just walking down to the high street. He had to trek for an entire day to get to the nearest bank. So Emmanuel's life was tough. He couldn't graze his goats on the greenest pastures. He always had to be within one day of a bank. But all of that changed due to what I would call a purposeful business. And this was Vodafone, the UK telecoms giant, because in 2007, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. Well, let me briefly explain what mobile money is, because often we think it's mobile banking. I have a bank account and I can operate it on my phone. I don't need to go to a branch. But with mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that was really important because 15 million Kenyan adults were unbanked at the time, but this allowed them to send money from phone to phone just as easily as you could send a photo or text message today. So this completely transformed Emmanuel's life. He doesn't need to deal with cash anymore. He doesn't need to worry about robbery or forgery. He can graze his goats where he wants to. But this is not a story about one person. This is a story about hundreds of thousands of people, because in the first seven years of launching M-Pesa, this lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. And many of these households are headed up by women. It allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail. So there was a large effect on gender equality. And the nice coda to this story is that Vodafone was able to make money from this. So even though this was something which was generated and inspired by the idea of serving society, of solving this problem of financial inclusion in Kenya, if you create value for society, ultimately people will be willing to pay you for that value. And so they were able to charge a small percentage of every transaction in the form of a fee. So that's one story. I'm going to tell you about Vodafone. But I'm now going to tell you a quite different story. And this different story surrounds tax, because in 2012, Vodafone released a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments worldwide. And obviously, fair tax is very important. It's particularly important in telecoms where you could locate your licenses in low tax countries. So why am I starting my talk with these two examples? It's to highlight the alternative view of purpose that I mentioned at the start. And to highlight this alternative view, 
I would like us to think about the answer to these two questions. So the first question is which of these decisions, launching M-Pesa or releasing that tax transparency report, created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public anger or worsened Vodafone's ESG rating or reputation? I'm not going to poll anybody because, as Matt said, there's going to be lots of time at the end for questions. And why I'm not going to poll anybody is most people I speak to, they agree with the answer. So, first question, which decision created most value for society? It was the first one. By launching m -Pesa, Vodafone lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and contributed to gender equality. But if I turn to that second question, what would have been the outrage if Vodafone had not launched m -Pesa? It would have been nothing. Well, you would not have been slammed by the media. There would have been no customer boycott. Why? Because nobody would have thought it was even possible to come up with this crazy idea of mobile money, of banking without a bank. But what is the outrage? from not being transparent on tax, it could be huge. And indeed, Vodafone themselves had suffered a nationwide boycott of their stores two years previously because of concerns that they were not paying enough tax. So this highlights the different view of purpose that I have and which is going to be the theme of my talk. So we often think about purpose as the answer to that second question. Right? Purposeful businesses should do no harm. They should not cheat on taxes. They should not pollute the environment. They should not mistreat their workers. And please don't get me wrong. Absolutely purposeful companies should not do harm. But I'm going to say that that is not enough. For a company to be purposeful, it's not enough for art to answer the second question and do no harm. You need to answer the first question and actively do good, actively create value for society. So why is that the correct way of thinking about purpose? Well, let me start with the moral and ethical case. Well, the moral and ethical case is that given the challenges the world faces today, it's not enough for a company to say, I am doing no harm. Instead, I need to contribute towards solving these challenges, be they climate change, diversity and inclusion, automation inequality. But that's a moral and ethical argument. I started my talk by saying I'm going to focus on the business and financial case. So what is the business and financial case of answering this second question? It's about risk management. Right? We want to avoid doing harm because if we do, there will be a scandal. We might be Volkswagen with emissions tests. We might be Wells Fargo with fake bank accounts. If we are purposeful, we're not going to involve in these scandals. But if we view purpose as just risk management, we will do the minimum possible to avoid a scandal, but we will not go above and beyond. Instead, what is the business and financial case of answering the first question? It could be huge. Why? Because if you create value for society, as I mentioned earlier, ultimately society will pay you for that and you can turn that into a profit. So I view purpose as something which inspires us to go above and beyond and to actively create value to solve social problems. And then as a byproduct of creating that value, it may well be that we can monetize. It. And so this is linked to the framework I introduced in the book that Matt kindly mentioned called Grow the Pie. So what is the pie? We often think that the company's value is given by a pie. And the value that it creates can be divided between investors in the form of profits and society in the form of fair taxes, fair wages, fair prices. So what do we think purpose is about? Often people think purpose is about splitting the pie more fairly. So let's donate some profits and give them to charity or pay higher taxes than we can get away with. And again, please don't get me wrong. Part of purpose is indeed fairness and equality, but purpose needs to be more than that. Why? Two reasons. 
First is if purpose is something that makes the company less profitable, then many chief executives won't want to embrace it. And this is the concern of greenwashing, right? You can state a nice purpose statement, but never put it into practice. And indeed, if the view is that purpose is at the expense of profit, then you will just have CEOs saying nice things, but never delivering, because if they deliver, the company is going to be less profitable. And the second reason why purpose can't just be about redistribution is it's bad for investors. Now, I know that we often portray investors as nameless, faceless capitalists, but well, what are investors? I don't need to tell this audience that a key part of investors are, are pension funds, which you're, many of you will be working for, right? Pension funds are investing for retirement. And indeed, while there's the controversy around ESG in the US, is if companies pursue stakeholder value at the expense of investor returns, then retirees will not be given their income in retirement. So this is why my view of purpose is that it's about growing the pie. So we absolutely do want to increase the orange, but the way we do that is by giving them a greater slice of what's already there. It's, it's not just by giving them a greater slice of what's already there, but through innovation, through excellence, through coming up with some crazy ideas like banking without the bank. Why? Because if we are creating value, then ultimately people will pay us for a share of value and therefore this will be turned into a profit. So ultimately what purpose is, is about value creation. Now the value that we're creating is social value, but if we create social value, then financial value will be a byproduct of growing the pie. Now at this point in my talk, you might think, well, everything I say, that sounds great. That sounds inspiring. Let's create value for everybody. But you might have many objections at this point, but you're just too polite to put them into the Q&A just yet. So one objection you might have is, is this really about purpose? I've said companies should create value, they should innovate. But do you need a purpose to do that? If you're a company who only cares about profit, wouldn't you create value to make money? Let's say you're an electric car company. You're, 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 let's say you're a normal car company. Would you make electric cars? Well, the answer is yes. Even if I don't care about climate change, I will build an electric car factory because there's money to be made. Right? A finance person like me can draw up a spreadsheet. I can forecast the profits of this car factory and I will go ahead for the financial reason, not because I care about climate change. However, there are many decisions that you cannot justify with a spreadsheet calculation. So if I go to Vodafone and M-Pesa, what is the net present value of launching M-Pesa? It would have probably been hugely negative, right? So why? It would have cost a huge amount of money to set this up. Nobody had ever done it before. And if you set this up, maybe people would use it for money laundering. That would be bad risk management. And even if you address that problem, Where's the money to be made from serving some of the poorest people in the world? So Vodafone had a strategy at that time, and that strategy was to expand in the West and to win Spectrum license auctions in the UK. That was where the money was to be made. This would have never been justified with a spreadsheet calculation. And this, to me, is the power of purpose. So this encourages companies to create to discover, to explore, to do things that they would not have done otherwise with a purely financial calculation. Yet, even though financial outcomes was not the motive, if you are creating value for society, ultimately then people will pay you for them. It's just like, let me step away from even alternative economic thinking. Let me get to philosophy. What is the meaning of life? Right, so if you think the meaning of life is happiness or joy, is that something you pursue directly? If I think about every decision, is this going to increase my happiness? I will probably eat a lot and drink a lot and never exercise and act selfishly. But if instead I say, well, my goal is to be a good parent and husband and colleague and friend, then ultimately I might actually become happier than if I was to pursue happiness directly through hedonism. And similarly, is profit something that we don't maximize directly, but instead we view profit as a byproduct 
of serving society, just like I'm going to view happiness as a byproduct of me being good, a, a good parent and husband and so forth. So that's one objection, which is, is purpose fundamentally different from um, a profit calculation? I would say it is. We are ditching the idea of spreadsheets and instead doing something because it creates value for society. But the second objection you might have is where is the evidence that this works? Right? What I've said sounds too good to be true. Companies that create value for society, they magically become profitable. But I've only given you one example of one company where this worked. How do you know I didn't handpick that one example because it supports me? And maybe in general, it doesn't hold. So that's why my day job as a business school professor is not to tell stories. It's not even to write case studies, but to look across hundreds of companies over dozens of industries and to see, well, is this something that holds true in large scale? So this is something I looked at myself about 15 years ago. So does purpose pay off? Now, the big challenge is how do we measure which companies are truly purposeful? And this is difficult. You can't look at a purpose statement. You might say some nice things and not deliver. So you might think, well, do you want to look at the expenditure? How much money do they spend? Do they put their money where their mouth is? Do they give to charity? But it could be that you give to charity and you don't give to the right charities. Any football fan on this webinar will know that the teams that spend the most money on players, they don't necessarily give the most results. So instead, I wanted to look at the results, the output, how much value you create for society, not how much money do you spend. And so what I looked at was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. These are companies that go above above and beyond in how they treat their employees. So why is that my measure of purpose? Why don't I look at climate? Because as Matt said, climate change is the greatest issue of our time. Well, climate change is really important, but it matters in some sectors more than others. So it matters in energy, maybe transport, but maybe not so much if you're in the tech sector. But for every company, employees are their critical asset, their most important asset, and a company's treatment of its employees, that's something which is socially really important. And also, I had this list of the best companies to work for. Remember, my idea is that purpose is about actively doing good, not just doing no harm. So this is not just the measure of avoiding strikes and avoiding labour unrest and avoiding people quitting. Instead, let's go above and beyond and be a place that people can really thrive and really contribute. And I had 28 years of data, which is very important to make sure this is not a flash in the pan. My data was from 1984 to 2011. So it contained things like the financial crisis, September the 11th, the collapse of the internet bubble. And why is this so important? People are concerned right now with this concerns about inflation and a recession. Can companies really think about purpose? Is this a luxury? Well, my data, that included many declines. So let me get to the bottom line. What I found was the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered shareholder returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period. So simply put, these companies that were treating their workers well, they weren't just fluffy companies that were giving part of their pie to employees by treating their employees well, they were growing the pie and ultimately shareholders were doing better off. And if you accumulate those numbers, it's 89 to 184% compounded. That is the business and financial case that I highlighted. But let me play devil's advocate one final time. Is this correlation or is this causation? I seem to be suggesting that if you treat your employees well, then your company performs better. But could it be the opposite? Once a company is performing well, then employees are happy, or maybe it can start spending money on employee gyms. Or maybe there's third factors that affect both. If you're a tech company, then employees are happy because the work is innovative and the tech industry has performed well. So I have to do a lot of analyses to address those alternative explanations and come to this as the bottom line. 
But let me not bore you with the methodology of how I did this. Instead, let me get to how to put this into practice, because that's hopefully the most important for um, you as practitioners. So the first section is purpose is about actively doing good, not just doing no harm. The second question is this does lead to a company being financially successful. That's not wishful thinking. But the third is how do we actually deliver? And a good place to start is for me to just to drill down a little bit more as to what the word purpose means, because this is something I think is somewhat misunderstood. So many companies have purpose statements which look a bit like this. So our purpose is to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment and communities and generate a return to investors. Now that sounds great. We serve everybody, but it's unrealistic because there are going to be trade-offs. For example, if I'm an energy company and I close down a, a power station, that's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers. So you cannot serve everybody. And if you think about what does the word purpose mean in the English language, it doesn't mean being all things to all people. It doesn't mean altruism, it means being focused and targeted. A purposeful meeting is one with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, I'm going to do it deliberately. So I define purpose as why a company exists, who it serves, its reason for being, and the role that it plays in the world. And that might seem a bit lofty and idealistic, so let me pick, up, pick it apart. This highlights the importance of being focused, why you exist, who you serve, that cannot be to solve every single one of the world's problems. So often people think that as a company, we should try to address all 17 sustainable development goals, but that is not your responsibility as a company. These are goals for countries, for nations. And it might be that the whole country achieves all 17, but some companies focus on one, two, and eight, and others focus on four, 10, and 15. So the question is, well, how do we know which goals to focus on? Now, if there's only one thing you remember from this talk, um, I'd like it to be this. To ask yourself a question, what is in my hand? What are the resources what is the expertise that my company has and how can I use this to serve society if I think a little bit more creatively? So for Vodafone, what was in their hand was telecoms expertise, which used to be used to send text messages. And they thought, well, how can we leverage this instead to transfer mobile money? And notice the idea of looking what's in our hand, looking internally at what we're good at, that is quite different to how many other companies will practice purpose, which is to look externally and to be reactive and maybe to swing in the wind in response to events out there. For example, after George Floyd was murdered, many companies started donating money to Black Lives Matter. Now, clearly, as an ethnic minority, I'm very supportive of racial equality. But if you're, say, a telecoms company, do you really have expertise in knowing whether Black Lives Matter is a better charity than, say, the American Cancer Society or Cancer Research UK, or just paying those wage that, that donation to your employees in the form of higher wages. So I think rather than just responding externally, make sure that anything you do which is purposeful uses what's in your hand because then you get much greater bang for buck. Indeed, the investment that Vodafone made in Mpesa was only £1 million, drop in the ocean compared to their capex budget of about £4, million in that, four billion in that year. Yet with that £1 million, it lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. So. What does what is in my hand mean? So let me end with three things and then there'll be the Q&A. So this first means doing new things. So new business generation driven by the idea of serving clients. So this might be new products and services for existing clients. So Vodafone launched mobile money rather than the normal telecom services, or it might involve finding new clients. 
Now, again, let me play devil's advocate. Shouldn't any company want to generate new business? Even if you don't have a purpose, shouldn't you build new products and find new clients to make money? Well, what a purposeful company might do is they might find new clients or invent new products, even if there is no financial calculation suggesting that it will be profitable. So that was the case, for example, for um, Vodafone and Mpesa. Let's give an example of, of finding new clients. So NatWest Bank, for example, they um, want to try to make um, finance accessible to all types of entrepreneurs. So with a startup business, you don't have a large track record. And so if there's no track record, then you don't really have sort of financial statements to base the lending decision of. So maybe you'll meet the entrepreneur and you'll judge his or her confidence. And there's studies finding that white male entrepreneurs will do much better in such meetings. And so they have this goal to promote minority entrepreneurship. And notice that this minority entrepreneurship is not just about females or ethnic minorities. It could well be to entrepreneurs in the North or people without college education, because there's multiple types of discrimination. It's not just about gender and eth ethnicity. It may well be that this fund, these funds go to white males from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So why do they do that? Well, the social case is, well, this is highly empowering. It's really good for society. Alison Rose, the CEO, when she did the Rose Review on Entrepreneurship, this found that the UK economy would go up by £250 billion if women had the same access to finance as men. But what is the business case for that? Well, it's if we are actually finding these potential um, borrowers who we might not have found otherwise because of the biases towards only lending to a certain type of entrepreneur, then we might have one leg up over our competition. So again, this is something which was socially motivated rather than motivated with a net present value calculation. But there is at least the business logic that if we do this, it will ultimately be something that grows the pie and leads to increased profits rather than donating the pie and actually worsening our financial position. Now, we can also think about the second aspect, which is doing the same thing, but in different ways. So why is that so important? Right, because I've said purpose involves doing new things and innovating, and innovation is great, but not every company can always innovate in every single way. Not every department within a company can do things innovatively. Let's say you're not in the R&D department. That's not something that you can control. Yes, so the idea of pandemic pivots, that's really inspiring. Yes, Vodafone and Pazer, that's an inspiring example. But you might think, well, those are not day-to-day -day things. So my number two and three will be a bit more sobering, but also a bit more day to day and more implementable. So number two is doing the same thing in different ways. And so excellence, just excellence in your core business, that could be hugely purposeful. So I've done some work with Network Rail, which operates the rail tracks in the UK and some of the stations. And they've talked about, well, how some of the things they do, which are purposeful, is to reduce graffiti at the stations. And obviously that is important. But the core business of helping the trains run on time with a well-functioning net network, that has a huge effect on wider society and allows people to get to their jobs, it allows people to live in the country and commute into the city and so on. So even more important than reducing graffiti or having employee volunteering programs is making sure that you are doing your core business really, really well. Now, again, you might think, well, doesn't any company want to be excellent, even if your only goal is to make money? But if you're a profit-oriented company, you will only pursue excellence in things that are clearly monetizable. But if you're one driven by purpose, then you will pursue excellence even if there's no financial benefit because you view yourself as serving society. So in my job as a finance professor, what is the most purposeful thing that I can do today? Maybe it wasn't the fact that I took public transport to the office rather than driving, but it might be that the lectures that I give, I try to ensure that they're current, they're relevant, they're practical and not just theoretical. Now, as a professor, you are only rewarded for your research, not your teaching, 
that's how you get your academic standing. And therefore, if I was to be a strategic professor, I wouldn't pay attention to my teaching. I only focus on my research. But if your purpose as a professor is the creation and dissemination of knowledge, then this is something that you will do, even if there are not extrinsic rewards. Also, it's important to highlight that purpose does not mean shying away from commercially necessary decisions. Purpose does not mean being naive. Sometimes companies do need to take difficult decisions for commercial viability, but purpose means that you might take that same decision in a different way. So let me give an example. So Airbnb, in the pandemic, they chose to shed 25% of their workforce. And I think this was the purposeful thing to do because had they kept those workers on, that business might not be viable. Even after the pandemic subsided, it's not clear that the travel sector will go back to what it used to be. And so had it just kept these employees on out of sympathy or loyalty, it would have jeopardized its long-term future. So it made them redundant, but it did this difficult decision in a different way. It gave them all 14 weeks of severance pay, even though there was no legal requirement in the US, one year of health insurance in a pandemic, and also it converted their recruitment division to an outplacement division to try to help them find alternative employment. And so the final thing is doing the same thing in the same way, but recognize the purpose of what you're doing. So what does that involve? So some of you will know this picture where three people are doing the same thing. One says, I am laying bricks. The other says, I am making a living. And the third says, I am building a cathedral. So the third person recognizes the ultimate purpose of what he's doing. Maybe the task he's doing is a small task, but it's contributing to a wider goal. So how does that apply to many jobs which are not involving, say, bricklaying? So let's go back to NatWest and, 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 and making loans. So after the um, pandemic was subsided, after lockdown was over, Alison Rose, the CEO, she took her senior management team out to a restaurant in Covent Garden called the Darjeeling Express. And the owner of that restaurant gave a little talk. She said, when I came to the UK 30 years ago, nobody believed in me. Well, I'm a woman. I'm an immigrant. Immigrant women, they just don't start businesses. They're not entrepreneurs. They don't get loans from banks. But NatWest, you believed in me. You gave me this loan. And you know that this loan allowed me to serve. I've probably served 10,000 customers at this restaurant. I've given a couple of hundred people jobs. And if you were the NatWest employee who worked on the loan approval, you might not think much of it. You might think, I've got some loans. Some go in the accept bucket. Some go in the reject bucket. But I don't really think much of it. But if you see the effect of your loan, if your loan allows an, an entrepreneur to fulfill her dream, create jobs, serve customers, then you see that ultimate purpose. And so maybe that will encourage you to go above and beyond in considering the information. Are there certain biases that might lend me to make a wrong decision on this loan? How do I want to go above and beyond and create more information and get more information when it'd be easier for me to say, computer says no. So my initial job at Morgan Stanley was as a, an investment banker, as an analyst. I started right at the bottom and there would be times, well, most of the time, actually, I would not go to the meeting. I was so junior. But if my boss called me from the meeting and said, hey, this meeting went well, and you know the analysis that you did all weekend, it actually came up in the week meeting and the client was really impressed by how carefully we understood the issue. That's something which didn't cost my boss anything in terms of time or money, but that made a huge difference. So particularly for many, I know there's many senior people in this audience with the client relationships who see the ultimate purpose as to what a company does, and maybe the junior people who are more internal, they might not see this. So can we do something to bring in internally those great stories about how our advice, how our products made a difference? And let me end by what happens if you are junior, because that's where I started. So as I mentioned, I was at Morgan Stanley. I thought there was nothing in my hand. If I was to apply this idea of what's in my hand, it's nothing. Nobody works for me. 
But I realised that people did work for me. My secretary did. The IT department did. And the most abused department in an investment bank is the graphics department. So you give them some unintelligible scribble, they turn them into PowerPoint slides. And often analysts shout at graphics for not doing what you asked, even though it was your fault because you didn't explain it clearly. So when I got good work back from graphics, I would just call them up and say thank you. And honestly, I didn't say thank you to be seen to be nice. I said thank you because I was genuinely grateful. But because I was right at the bottom, I didn't have my own office. I sat on the open plan floor, which is called the bullpen. And therefore, when I said thank you, other analysts heard me and they said thank you themselves. And I'm not going to claim we changed the entire culture of this global investment bank, but maybe on that floor of those offices in Canary Wharf, London, people started to treat each other a little bit more kindly. So we often think about ourselves as a thermometer. A thermometer reflects the temperature around us, so if the atmosphere is cutthroat, we need to be cutthroat to survive. But can we actually play thermostat and affect the temperature around us by what's in our hand, even if it's something simple as our own words? Okay, so let me wrap up. And as, as um, Matt kindly mentioned, um, I wrote this book a couple of years ago. Why? Because I think for far too long, people thought about purpose as being worthy, nice to have a luxury, but not something a serious business person should embrace because it's a distraction from profits. What I've tried to highlight is purpose is supportive of profits, in particular, if you view it as actively doing good, not doing no harm. But when we think about actively doing good, it's not about solving all of the world's problems, but to do so in a targeted and focused way by using what's in our hand. And that's not just doing new things. It could be doing the same thing in different ways or the same thing in the same way, but recognising our ultimate purpose. So let me pause there. Let me stop sharing and uh, hand back to, to Matt, who's going to be coordinating uh, the Q&A. Thanks, Alex. That was uh, that was fascinating, very thought provoking. So people can start to um, to lodge their questions. We've got one or two, but uh, if you can start uh, typing away, that'd be great. So may maybe I'll take chair's prerogative, Alex, and throw you the first one. So um, I um, I mentioned in, in my introduction that uh, purpose is, is somewhat controversial. Um, I'm sure there are some naysayers out there. Um, yeah, do you, do you across, come across many naysayers? And, and if so, what's the biggest pushback you tend to receive from them in respect of your ideas? Yes, thank you. So um, there are naysayers to the general idea of, of, of purpose. And I think that they, they, they will argue, well, that purpose is a distraction, is not the purpose of a company to generate long-term returns. But then if I argue, well, actually purpose does generate long-term returns, then that will address... Um, their, their main concerns. So actually, to my work, I don't really see too much opposition. What I instead see is the opposite problem. I don't see as much forward momentum as you might have from another view. So, so what I'm trying to argue is how companies can serve society and also be profitable. Now, there's other views, which is let's companies not care at all about profit and just care about saving the planet and promoting diversity and inclusion. Now, that does get a lot of popularity, because if you say, OK, companies shouldn't even think about profit, there is a subsegment of the population which will get really behind that because that's a partisan view. There's now the anti-woke crowd, so people like Vivek Ramaswamy, who will argue, oh, actually, companies should only care about profit, not these woke issues which should be dealt by the government. And they get a lot of popularity because I'm sort of in the middle saying, yes, companies need to serve society, but they need to do so in a, in, in a, in a profitable way. I don't so much get pushback because there is elements of what I say which will appeal to both sides of the spectrum. But I won't get as much push forward because there will be elements that some people disagree with. So if you're more on the progressive side, you might say, well, I'm not radical enough. Maybe we should give it, forget about profit. And if you're on the right hand side, you might say, ah, oh, maybe I'm too sympathetic towards society. Great, thanks. Um, we got one question come in. So that's from uh, Louise Pryor, who's the next president of the IFOA. 
So he says, um, of course, there are corporate structures that aren't focused only on the financials, B Corp, Corps and mutuals. Uh, and I know Louise is involved in one of the, those, those such companies. And she says, should we be looking more at these alternate structures and developing other similar structures? Yeah, thanks very much, Louise, for, for the question. I, I do have a lot of sympathy for those alternative structures. But what I'll say is that even in the regular publicly traded corporation, you have many different types of structures within that. For example, even if you're a publicly traded corporation, one lever that you have to play with is the lever of CEO incentives. So if indeed one advantage of a mutual structure is, say, a long term thinking, that's something that you can get in a corporation. Why? By paying the CEO according to the long term and making sure that they care about the company beyond their tenure. So Paul Polman at Unilever, when he retired, he had to have, I think, 500% of his final salary in shares in the company a year after he retired, 250% two years after he retired. So if your horizon is longer than your tenure, then you're going to be putting a long, lot of these things into place. And that avoids some of the challenges that you might have in mutual organisations, which might be capital raising is, 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 is more difficult and so on. Another thing which is, is good about uh, mutuals is you might have, say, large investors. Well, the investor in a mutual, the owners there, they are your membership. But similarly within corporations, rather than having really fragmented fragmented share ownership to have a couple of anchor shareholders. Why is that useful? Because if there's a shareholder with a lot of skin in the game, then how will they analyze the company? They won't just look at short-term metrics like earnings. They will have a lot of incentive to look at non-financial measures of form performance. So just like Louise correctly says, are the corporate structures are not just focused on the financials. Similarly, I'd say even in a regular corporation, there's many investors who aren't just focused on the financials. This is why often investors are encouraging companies to go beyond and go faster in terms of climate change, in terms of diversity, equity and inclusion. But that's only the case if you're an investor with a large enough stake to do your own research and to look at these issues. So I do think there's a lot to be had, said out of the, the regular corporate structure. Now with B Corps and mutuals, the actual evidence I see is, is is more mixed than one might think. So sometimes you can say, okay, there was this B Corp and it did really, really well. However, actually there's a heterogeneity. And in terms of mutual structures like John Lewis, for example, that's one which has uh, come under some difficulties. And also you have this correlation versus causation issue. Is it that once you are already doing well, then I can afford to become a B Corp because that does require a lot of reporting and so forth. Or is it that becoming a B Corp makes you do well? And that's something that's really difficult to disentangle. So certainly I have time for um, these structures. I'm an angel investor in some companies that are B Corps. For example, New Ground Coffee Company, which hires ex-offenders. Ade, which is an athleisure um, company. However, I wouldn't necessarily say that one is better than the other, that you need to adopt that structure to be purposeful. I know that this wasn't in Louis's question. These are options to think about, but I would say that if you're a publicly traded corporation, you do have options as well, such as lengthening the highest of executive incentives, making sure that you report on these non-financial performance measures, not just the numbers. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, a couple more questions come in, but, but uh, keep, keep them coming in, guys, if you can. Um, one from Barry Shannon. What are the main hurdles internally and externally that prevent companies moving to their preferred state of purpose? Thanks, Barry. Um, I'd say two things. So, so one of them is, is the pie splitting mentality is just so ingrained in us is that we often think that the world is win lose, right? When we're kids, we play games where the way of winning is to hurt the other person. Let's like, say Monopoly, how do you win? You bankrupt your opponent. And so like intrinsically, we, we, we see the world as, as being a fixed pie. So even if there's evidence suggesting that we can do better with cooperation, that's something which is antithetical to many people. The second and the more nuanced reason is even if you believe in everything that I've said, it does require a long term mindset, which is linked to my answer to Louise, because in the short term, the pie is fixed. Right? In the short term, if you are to cut worker wages, you do increase your profits. Now, in the long term. If you cut worker wages, they'll leave and so on. But it may well be that some executives are to focus on the short term because of how they're remunerated. 
And maybe some of this short termism comes from investors because investors might also have to care about their quarterly returns because that will lead to their clients staying with them or, or moving. So I think if there are things that we can do within the system to make the system more long term, that will be beneficial. I talked about this in terms of executive incentives, but also let's think about investor or asset manager incentives. Um, so there are pension funds which make it very clear to the asset managers that they own only care about long-term performance. So if you look at Brunel Pension Partnership, they have an accord and the accord says with the managers that they hire, they don't really care about the short term, right? They're always going to be looking at long-term performance. So therefore you, you should have the confidence to bet and invest in companies with good long-term prospects, even if they're not going to deliver the highest short-term earnings. And so as, as, the, as to the extent to which these messages get fed into the system, then that's something which I think will hopefully try to move uh, the system towards what we'd like it to, to uh, appear like. Great. Thanks, Alex. And thanks, Barry, for the question. Question here from Nikki Holtzhausen. Um, great question, actually. How can governments improve their purposefulness? I think, yeah, I agree. This is a really important question. And I think governments have a huge role to play in this because um, there's many free marketers who argue, oh, governments should just do nothing and companies should achieve everything all by themselves. But I don't think this is correct. Right? A mainstream economics acknowledges there's market failure. And the role of government is to address market failures. Markets don't work perfectly. And there's an entire chapter of my book, chapter 10, which addresses this. So let me look at a couple of things. Number one is taxation and subsidies. So um, when you have an externality, that is something where you affect society. And even in the long term, your effect on society does not come back and affect your profits. So my whole idea of growing the pie is your effects on society ultimately bounce back and impact you. And that's true for many things, but it's not true for certain things like externality. So if there's no fair carbon tax, then I can pollute away. And who's going to lose from this? It's going to be, say, the owner of a um, beachfront um, property because the sea level is going to rise, for example. So I think one huge role is to tax um, activities which have negative externalities from society so that companies will take into account their social damage and then will take actions to attenuate it. And then the contrast, do we want we can subsidise activities with positive externalities be this thing such as research and development, be it also, um, say, um, hiring people who might be structurally unemployed, in particular, if there are losers from decarbonisation, such as people who were working in the oil and gas sector, can we um, help subsidise um, this? Otherwise, we would have the human version of stranded assets, which are people who are unable to retrain and they unable to get jobs. Another answer in terms of governments improving their purposefulness is I think governments can partner with the private sector. So we often see these things as black and white, but they can work well together. So with the Vodafone example, I apologize if I gave too much credit to them, but how they noticed that Kenyan citizens were transferring mobile minutes to each other was through the DFID. Department for International Development, actually Vodafone had relationships with DFID, which meant that they saw this potential for Mpesa, and I think that's something which is useful. I think the third and final thing, there's, there's sort of eight things in my chapter, but let me just go through three because there might be other questions. The third thing I think government should do is to play their role in enforcing competition and to stop monopoly power. So if there's two great mergers and if companies are too powerful, then market forces can't operate. So one market force is if a company is non-purposeful, then, then employees will walk away, then customers will walk away. But that requires there to be somewhere else to walk to. And if this is not possible because there's a glo globally dominant search engine and you can't move away from this, then that's not something where um, the market forces will work. So to enforce competition and to stop large scale monopolies, I think will be very powerful. Thanks, Alex. Um, another question coming in. Uh, risk of putting you on the spot, Alex. Um, uh, question is, purpose is arguably ingrained in the concept of ESG. In one of your articles, you previously described ESG both as extremely important and nothing special. Could you elaborate on your thoughts here? 
Absolutely. Well, thank you for, for mentioning that article. So that's an article called The End of ESG. And you might think, well, that's really weird that an ESG advocate like me will write an article um, called that. So let me first sort of share the article. And why would I do this? Because it's unusually, it's not an academic article. So this was an article for practitioners. If you can look at it, there's not a single equation here. It was an essay, which was like the rate up of a keynote speech that I gave to a practitioner conference. It's open access, so there's no paywall behind it. And so let me highlight the line which the question asker just raised. ESG is extremely important and nothing special. So let me break this down. So what do I mean by it being extremely important? Well, if ESG or purpose, which is related, is about creating long-term value for a company, then everybody should care about it, even if you don't have ESG in your job title. So why I call this article ES the end of ESG is I think the term ESG can be unhelpful because it suggests that it's niche. It should only be something that ESG investors should care about not mainstream investors, or if, in the U if you're in the US, only Democrats should care about not Republicans because it's become quite polarised. But what I'm highlighting is if ESG is about creating long-term value, then a CEO of a company should care about it, not just the chief sustainability officer. And in an asset manager, then a mainstream investor should care about it. So for seven years, I've been on the ESG advisory committee for Royal London Asset Management, our chief investment officer comes to every meeting. So most of the funds he is responsible for do not have an explicit ESG mandate, but he realizes, no, this is just important in terms of good investment. And so that's why I said ESG is extremely important. So where does the nothing special part come? That's the other extreme. So there are some people who think, well, ESG is only for ESG people, not for mainstream people. I've highlighted that it's for everybody. But also ESG should not be put on a pedestal compared to other issues. For example, if a company was to nowadays say, oh, let me issue a press release saying I'm going to introduce a scholarship program to hire uh, ethnic minorities, they'll get loads and loads of um, good publicity. And obviously, as an ethnic minority, I'm very sympathetic to that. But is that more important than being a company and, say, improving your productivity? or being a company and making some great innovation, or being a company and reducing your costs. And if reducing your costs means using fewer resources and helping respect planetary boundaries, those are all great things. So why I say ESG is nothing special is if we put ESG on a pedestal and we say, well, companies should focus more on ESG issues rather than their core business, rather than be excellent at the core things that a company does, then this can be somewhat distracting. So I think ESG is important, but it's as important as other things that drive long-term value. That's great. Thanks, Alex. Um, I was going to try and slip in another question, but I think we're probably out of time, unfortunately. So with that uh, uh, excellent response, I think I'll draw today's events to a close. I wanted to thank everyone for attending and uh, also to thank the IFOA events team for doing the logistics and making it all happen. Thank you, guys. Uh, but of course, I'd especially like to thank Alex for his excellent contribution uh, and for a fascinating discussion. You can see the QR code that's come on the screen. If you could uh, take a second just to sort of zap that and fill in feedback, it would be much appreciated by the events team. Um, so that really concludes the uh, presidential series for 2023. Um, but I'd like to encourage you all to sign up to our next big event, which is the flagship cross-practice conference, uh, which is being held in person in London and online, actually, across the 26th and 27th of June. Uh, we have five plenaries, 35 technical workshops, a great um, a roster of uh, speakers, uh, so an opportunity to hear from a range of high-profile uh, industry uh, experts. And early tickets, uh, early bird tickets for that are uh, available online until I think the 5th of May. So I'd encourage you all to sign up for what should be uh, a great couple of days. There you go on the screen, you can see that now. Uh, so uh, that concludes today's events. Thank you all again. Thank you so much, Alex, for, for your time uh, and insight. That's been fascinating. Uh, I wish you all a good, uh, uh, good rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks.